This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Are you a kid adult at heart? Recent market research has shown the, re- the number of people buying toys who are over 12 years old is growing. This consumer group is being called kidults. They now comprise a quarter of the toy retail market, not to mention a pretty stunning 60% of the market's growth over the last year ending last September. That's according to the market research company NPD Group. Today, we'll hear from one slime maker who says many of her customers are adults. And a very serious disclosure here, this includes producer Katie Pellico, who says playing with slime transports her to childhood and playing with Play-Doh. Our senior producer, Tess Terrible, is a big fan of her penguin Squishmallow plushie named Shackleton. And I myself am also a huge fan of plushies. I've recently gotten a gigantic Squishmallow bird named Priscilla as a birthday present, who is now sitting comfortably at my work desk, and she brings a lot of joy to the entire office. And speaking of office, we'll also hear picks from Connecticut public staffers throughout the hour, and we also want to hear from you. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live, and send us a picture of your best plushie friend. Our first guest this morning has studied why familiar toys appeal to us today, showing how we played as children informs how we socialize now. Dr. Kathy Hirsch-Pasek is a professor of psychology at Temple University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hirsch-Pasek, for joining us today. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, I am happy to hear the enthusiasm. (laughs) What is your response to this idea of kidults? I think we should all be more kidulting. Um, As somebody who has played my whole life, I think it's a great release in a time after COVID. And I think it helps us see the world through the lens of creativity and awe. And I think it's time to get back to that. And I think from a lot of the things that we've been reading and what we've been talking about, the pandemic certainly played a pretty big role when it comes to kidulting. Um, But where does that technology come from in terms of the bigger picture? Well, I think the bigger picture here is that we had a terrible couple years, you know, and uh, mental health issues went skyrocketing and we all felt the pressure. Um, especially if we lived in a home with kids and the kids were home and everything was shut down, it was really tough for people. So I I think we ended up working more than 24 seven. Um, and it was all on devices. I actually came up with a name called Zoomified because I felt Zoomified during this period. And I think it highlighted for all of us that technology sometimes takes us away from what we're all about as human beings social engagement, and having fun with others. Mere joy, the simplicity of joy. And I think we need to get it back. I love that, the simplicity of joy, which also is not that simple in of itself, right? Because it brings us such happiness. And, you know, we, we, you know we're just talking about the pandemic playing a big role in, in this idea of kidulting, but that's not new, right? This concept of, of, of kidults? Oh, no, it's not. It actually started in the 1950s in the television industry. And you'll see throughout time that marketers have tried to capture an adult market. Um, you know, if you look at at toys like Lego, I'm like, my gosh, there's master sculptors everywhere who do incredible things with Legos. So a lot of these toys go all the way up from kidhood into late adulthood. And like are Squishmallows, I mentioned in the, in the <laughs> beginning. You know, as I'm holding one, um, I have a turtle named Egg. Um, yes. And are they great in isolation? Is this, is there, is there something about the comfort of something that's squishy and soft? You know, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> well, I can't tell you that there's any scientific research that I know on that. I know that they often make these things to be very, very cute and lovable. And I will admit that I fall prey too. I have bought so many big bears and big rabbits and big whatever when I go to the store for babies who absolutely don't need them and for parents who really don't have room for them, but I just can't resist. And why do you think many of these are meant to be used in isolation? Do you think that speaks to a unique moment in time and phenomenon, or is this something that's always been around, you think? Well, I I actually think that this is one of the problems of our current history. 
Um, I think in 2007, when uh, we had the invention of the modern cell phone, um, and as we moved to 2011, when the iPad came in, um, what we were seeing is more and more stuff going digitally and more and more stuff going toward isolated play. And that can be kind of dangerous because one of the hallmarks of what it means to be a part of the human species is to have a social brain. That is, we learn through relationships. We learn with other people. So the more that the world takes us away from other people, the more dangerous it is for our species. And I think we just have to get back to it. Now, I'll just say one thing about the plushies, which is some people think, and there have been a lot written on it, certainly for little guys, that the plushies can sometimes, you know, be comforters that take the place of some humans. But really, honest to godly, they don't. They don't respond in the same way. They just feel good. You know, we're here to talk about plushies, so you can talk all the plushies you want. Um, and it is very comforting, I must say, at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and I think the word kidult is pretty self-explanatory. And I'm wondering, is nostalgia at play here? Thinking about, you know, happy meals for adults, which was something that recently sold out really quickly at McDonald's or slime as the modern day Play-Doh. Well, nostalgia is a big deal. And let's just look at two examples that I, I really love. One is that I was at a Godiva chocolate store and I was wondering, why was I so into like the excitement of picking out what chocolate I wanted, be it the dark praline or something else? I went nuts. And then I realized, oh, my gosh, that was a clever idea. It turns out they made the counter taller. OK, and when you make the counter taller, adults are in the same position they were from that nostalgic little kid when you first looked in the candy store. And that made me want to buy more or another one. When I've been at Disney and I smell the Toll House cookies everywhere I go, gosh, it brings back my childhood. And when it does, I feel a kind of release that's really quite wonderful. I just want to make sure everyone knows that you heard it here first that Kathy went nuts for pralines at a Godiva store. Um, you're, you're also the author of Making Schools Work, Bringing the Science of Learning to Joyful Classroom Practice. You know, yeah. What's your sense of that loss of playtime as kids is related to this desire for playtime as adults? Well, I think in general, what we don't recognize, especially let's take adults watching kids. We know that they have awe over everything, right? Little kids will stop on the street and find awe in a slug under a rock. Can't tell you I'm there. Or we're rushing our kids to get in the car for school. But of course, they meander a bit because they see something a little bit more interesting. So what I'd like to suggest is that we open our eyes to the awe that our children see and that we have, in a sense, lost. It's almost been beaten out of us. But really, when kids are playing, it's kind of like a liberal arts education for them. They're learning how to communicate with others. They're learning how they can get Johnny off the swing so that they can use it. They're learning about mathematics as they put those blocks together to build a taller tower and physics to see if the tower will stay up. And we don't look at the world that way anymore. But I think that if we brought some of those methods back into our classrooms, and I will tell you, I'm even using those methods in my college classrooms, and my students are learning so much better. It brings joyful teaching and deeper learning in a whole lot of topics that are important for the workforce of today. And on a related note, I want to read you something that um, we asked a uh, research scientist at the Yale Child Study Center, Jessica mm -hmm. Hoffman, who studies mm -hmm. the power of play uh, for, on her thoughts on the rise of toys for adults. So she says she hadn't heard of the term, but says, I think the key here is that playing and playfulness are, are very much for everyone, not just children. And many of us lose our playfulness as we age, starting even at age 10 when we care about conventionality and fitting in with our peers. So by adulthood, we have lost practice with getting into flow states and the joy of being silly. 
Of course, she says this is not for everyone, or this is not uh, this does not happen to everyone. But I think there has been a recent resurgence in realizing the benefits of fun through play and the need for time away from work for well being. We see adult Lego sets, card games, board games, and sports like disc golf and pickleball that are taking off in popularity. I think what Jessica said is very similar to what you've been saying, Kathy. And I'm wondering, you know, can you respond to what she says, and、um, can you talk more about how you see the links between how adults inform or are inspired by the way their kids play, and how do how did the way we played as kids inform the way we socialize as adults? Well, I think first of all, play brings in. It doesn't have to. It can be solo, as you suggested. Uh, but play often indicates that you're playing with someone else, and that's something we just don't have enough of anymore. There was a recent article that came out, <clears throat> I think it was last week, talking about what does it mean for adults to be happy, because a lot of adults aren't happy today, and they said that one of the most important things is having important re- relationships in your life and having a sense of community. Play is one of the things that helps you do that. And it doesn't need to be formal play. It could just be going around. It doesn't be a board game. It be, can be going for a walk, exploring things you've never done before, going and jumping off a mountain together, whatever it is, doing an escape room. These kinds of fun activities help to build relationships, and we need more of them. Your next question, I think that that、um, Jessica mentioned, is you know why have we lost it? And I think the world has pushed us into a place where we are working twenty four seven, because we take our work with us everywhere that we go. We don't turn off the cell phones. We don't turn off the notifications. So by doing that, we're an anxious wreck waiting for the next text to come in. We need a little recess. So I'm going to make a bold ca- a bold claim here, which is that I think we should vote for adult recess time. We all need it. It'll make us more creative. It'll make us happier, and it will build social relationships. And with that, I want to add one more thing. <clears throat> In the era of ChatGPT, what we see is that technology is encroaching not just on blue collar jobs, but also on some of the white collar jobs. And I think what's going to be privileged in the future is what I'll call for the moment an age of creativity. An age where we can link things together that have not been linked together before. At least at this point, ChatGPT and Bing and the others can't do that, but humans can if they reclaim their sense of awe. And I think that's where we need to go. So you're saying we need to have adult recess, and I'm also saying we should have adult naps. So I feel like this is going to work out really well for both yeah, of us. Yeah, it's、right? looking good. It's looking good. <laughs> Love it. And so I, I also want to share.、Um, uh, Connecticut Public's education reporter Leslie Cosme Torres says she revisited her love for Lego at the end of the or at the start of the pandemic, and she says you know she sits on her floor at her apartment building building Legos like a child, and it bring it brought her so much joy. Can you talk to us about where these more, you know, mindfulness activities like puzzles or Lego fit in versus free play or recess activities? Well, I, I mean, I think we've already really mentioned it. it. It's giving yourself a break. Just give yourself a break. Look, that break can come from mindfulness.、Uh, some say it can come from prayer. There's a lot of different ways for us to give ourselves a break, but we don't do it. And play is one of those areas that gives humans a break. It, it's taking us away from the busyness and the clutter of our everyday lives, and allowing us to expand our imagination, our creativity, and our social engagement. It's really, really powerful, and it's all packed into that little four-letter word. I know it's only nine twenty, but take a break, guys. Take a break, people. It's、uh, that's what Kathy's saying. <laughs>、yeah. Take a break. And、uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of us are are finding different ways to find that joy. Like you're mentioning,、um, we have a project manager here, Meg Fitzgerald, who says coloring brings her a lot of joy. She loves、mm-hmm. those Zen coloring books and has too many. Are coloring books also in this category as well? 
Oh, sure. I mean, art supplies are wonderful and they're, they're really creative exercises. The only thing I'll ask of your production manager is to let herself color outside the lines a little bit because that's going to be important too. As adults, we're playing a lot of time in the lines and we need to get out of them. Think differently. How could the world be different if you reimagined it? And we also um, gave our company a survey and got a lot of reactions from people who love uh, board games and mm-hmm. every, you know people are buying them or, or keeping them from childhood or starting new new games. How do you categorize board games in this conversation? Are these more strategy based uh, versus the free play we're talking about, or is it a little mindfulness, mindlessness? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I think I think board games go into a number of different categories, right? I mean, board games can be strategy if you're playing something like Risk. Uh, board games like Monopoly are definitely strategy, and and the most important thing about the board game is not that you're learning how to mount a war, you know, to take over Europe but instead that you're getting together with other people to do it. And that's what makes board games so great. I don't know anybody who sits around and plays Monopoly against themselves. That's a challenge in of itself. Perhaps <laughs> someone wants to take on that and let us know there how that go. goes yeah. for you. Um, you know, we talked about stuffed animals and squishmallows seem to be very pure and just comfy and happy because it's about hugging them or holding mm-hmm. them. You know, what, mm-hmm. are, what are your thoughts in terms of how that brings comfort? How what gives comfort? I'm sorry. What are your thoughts about how that uh, plays into what we're talking about um, right now? You know, mindlessness. Yeah. Yeah. It's as I said before, you know, um, these kind of plush toys, they just feel good and they're nostalgic. And I like to snuggle with them. So I, I think it's a fine thing to have these moments where you just feel safe and comfortable. As I look at the world around us, one of the things we have lost is a lot of the sense of safety, whether it's through the gun violence that is projected on the news really every single day, or whether it's the news about climate change, which is inevitable and which is we're seeing the fires, we're seeing the rainstorms, we're seeing tornadoes in places that they shouldn't exist. And we are hearing about a war every day in Ukraine and where Russia can just invade. So as we hear this news, it pelts us with the world is unsafe, the world is unsafe, the world is unsafe. Again, we need a recess from it. And I suggest adults all schedule in recess. Now I'm going to make a public admission here. Probably shouldn't, but I will. The other day in Philadelphia, in February, it was 72 degrees out. Unbelievable. So I decided that it was time for me to put in my calendar meeting and it went for two hours and I bolted out and went to play tennis. That's what we need to do. I love the bolting, but that really describes your eagerness to go and play tennis. That's that's the energy I think we need here. (laughs) And even if not energy, so just say meeting and go have a chocolate sundae. And don't forget to put the sprinkles on the top. Who doesn't like sprinkles, right? <laughs> we got to do mean, that. I mean, I can't more. even imagine it. <laughs> and I, w- I want to share it on that note. Uh, Tracy on Facebook shared with us that I asked for a Squishmallow for Christmas and didn't get one. Finger crossed for my birthday coming up. I still have three stuffed animals from my childhood. Ralph, a big bulldog from when I was five. <laughs> Henry, a dog I got when I was seven, and K-Bear, a koala bear I got when I was about nine or ten. I still (laughs) sleep with the latter two, no shame. And so we also looked into, um, sleep psychologist Dr. Jade Wu looked into the magic of sleeping with a stuffed animal after discovering that it helped her during her pregnancy. You know, what are your thoughts on this about, like, sleep methods traditionally thought of for babies or now they're now being suggested for adults? Well, I mean, truthfully, I'm not going to be judgmental. I would like to meet Ralph. So um, I I think whatever works for you to make you feel safe, to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel happy, and to give yourself a break is a good thing. 
You've been listening to doc- our Dr. Kathy hirsch Pasick, who will be staying with us after the break. We'll hear more about her work installing public play spaces around the world and in Connecticut through the Brookings Institution. We want to hear from you this hour. What toys or what toys for kids still spark joy for you? Send us a picture on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. The market of people over 12 years old who are buying toys like puzzles, plushies, and coloring books is growing. This hour, we're exploring the psychology of this demographic, sometimes called kidults. Connecticut Public investigative editor Walter Smith Randolph says, yo-yos take me back to the schoolyard. They made a comeback when I was in middle school circa 2000. What toys from childhood have you recently revisited? We want to hear from you. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And back with us to discuss this very topic of kidulting is Dr. Kathy hirsch Pasek. She's a professor of psychology at Temple University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Kathy, can you tell us about the Learning Landscapes Initiative and how it was designed with adults in mind? Oh, absolutely. I am so excited about Playful Learning Landscapes. Um, What I thought of one day, it was, I guess, a Sunday afternoon, and I thought, whoa, we could put play out in public spaces and have all adults and all kids just playing together on these wonderful, in these wonderful activities that would build social capital and mental capital. And I called it Playful Learning Landscapes. It started on October 10th, 2010, in New York City, when we took over Central Park and put in 28 science-inspired activities that were just fun to do. It included Legos and Crayola, and we were building with clay, and we were using cardboard boxes to build forts. Well, you had to see what happened. The New York City uh, parks told us we'd be lucky to get 6,000 people who would come, and that would have been amazing but instead 50,000 showed up and our reach ended up being 10 million. And from there we moved on to say, well, why can't we change what supermarkets look like? Why can't we change public libraries? What about bus stops in cities? And now we've grown into a bit of a worldwide phenomenon. That 10 million, that's a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it was more than I expected, yeah. let me tell you. <laughs> well, and so I was going to ask, you know, um, y- these are examples that <clears throat> you've designed to build STEM skills at, <clears throat> at these parks and bus stops and, and whatnot. Can you tell us about the reactions from the adults? Like, did people get off their phones and jumped <laughs> at it or what did you see? Well, there are a couple of different reactions. So I- I'm going to share uh, just a couple of stories for you. <clears throat> the first is um, we put up a sign. Um, and it was when I was little, I played and it was just a chalkboard. Okay. That we painted. I think the whole, the whole concept maybe cost us 50 bucks. We spray painted the whole thing and then we left chalk for kids and adults to just fill in. When I was little, I played. All right. What happened? I expected this would take a couple weeks to fill up. And it was, uh, it was built on the work of a wonderful artist who wrote the Before I Die. But I thought, let's build a play. I put it in an area that's a super under-resourced environment and just wanted to see what would happen. These people got off the bus. I mean, people who just stopped, looked at our sign, started laughing, started smiling, picked up the chalk that we had left and filled in the entire, I think we had maybe 80 spaces in a matter of an hour and a half, two hours. And what did they put on it? Well, they were joking around, talking to each other. Oh, yeah, when I was little, I played four square. Oh, when I was little, I used to hit the cards against the wall. Oh, yeah, when I was little, I used to play with dice. It was amazing to see. And that's the kind of response we have had everywhere. In Philadelphia, we picked an under-resourced area. We asked the families, what do you want to see? Where do you want to be? And they said, we want this particular area outside of church. 
where Martin Luther King had given one of his freedom marches. We said, great, let's build it together. What do you want? They said, well, let's do puzzles. So we have big puzzles, one with Martin Luther King on it. The kids, the adults play together. They play a hopscotch game that we did that's built on a psychological test of executive function or impulse control. Together, the adults and kids are playing with it right out there while they wait for the bus stop. That's our response, and that's what we're seeing everywhere. And it sounds like it's a very universal thing to to be reminded that playing is a good thing and it sparks so much joy. I just want to quickly let our listeners know that you can find more information about where these playscapes are located on our website at ctpublic.org slash where we live. And there's also one at the Stepping Stones Museum for Children in Norwalk. And so I want to ask, we, you know, we talked, you just mentioned the chalkboard installations. Mm-hmm. It kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of, of certain places. There are walls with post-its and you can mm-hmm. grab the post-its and write a kind word. And and I think people tend to be very responsive to that. Um, you know, you, you noted recess-friendly activities with other kids um, mm-hmm. were common, you know, from people who... Uh, are you know reminiscing or they're just thinking about things that they like to do uh, why do you think there's an emphasis now on toys that can also be played in isolation well i think people don't have time and i think tech has drawn us into these worlds that are solo we call them social media we say there's social engagement but i can't see the face of the person behind the avatar Um, Nonetheless, it's like candy. And so I'm very attracted to going into these games. Um, But again, I want to come back to a really, really critical point that's as true for adults as it is for kids. And we can look at our own screen time and we can see how attracted we are to our own games that we play solo, solo, solo. Yes, the world has pushed us here. But as a species, our brain does not push us here. Our brain pushes us towards social human interaction. And we just need to reclaim it. And I think that's what you're seeing in this backlash, which I think is not even really a backlash. It's really more of a way forward, a way forward to reclaim what makes humans humans. And that's social interaction. People do need people. Well, and I also want to share a little social interaction that's been going on at Connecticut Public is our newsroom editor, Matthew Long Middleton, has an awesome poster to color on his back wall, which is I love it. a fun thing to do to breathe and take a moment, says one of our reporters. And I myself have colored on it. And I did color a little bit out of the lines and I mixed and matched a little bit. Good, so, you know. good. I'm proud of you. I'm, <laughs> I'm proud so of you. Glad. Thank you so much. I can. <laughs> I, my life will only go downhill from here, honestly. Um, um, and, you know, we talked a lot about about um, kids learning socially and, and doing, you know, playing with games that are engaged rather than distracted and, and having interaction, especially when it's joyful. Um, you also talk about the idea that play in of itself is not a specific activity, but an, an approach to learning. Exactly. And, yeah, an engaged and fun mm-hmm. and curious way of discovering mm-hmm. the world. This is something that was said by another professor of uh, applied psychology at New York, New York University who studies play and learning and babies and young children. Can you talk about the idea of that? I know we we talked about it back and a little bit back and forth throughout the conversation, but you know, studying it from from babies <clears throat> and young children, you know, what do we take from that? What can we learn from that? <laughs> well, we can learn a lot from that. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just two examples that were just fun for me. One was to helping to open up parents' eyes. Now, when when I go down the street today, I often see parents on a cell phone and kids in a stroller. That means the interaction isn't happening. And when I look at what the kid is looking at instead and try to let them lead the way, I can see some pretty remarkable things that kids are picking up on. Patterns of the leaves. My gosh, I forgot to look. What makes one leaf different than another leaf? How can I compare them? How many stones, shells at the beach can I pick up that are different kinds of shells. Look, that brings us back to our childhood as well, but it's also pattern matching. And when I'm doing pattern matching, I'm doing pre-math. Whoa, who would have thought? 
Or let me give you the approach to the wide-eyed teacher, not just the wide-eyed parent. I was talking to a first grade teacher who we were training from making schools work and what we call the active, playful learning approach. And the teacher said, oh my gosh, I have spent so much time on these worksheets trying to teach the kids how to do the number line. And I said, wow, you don't really need to do that. Uh, let's try another way. And she said, well, what, what could we do? Should we just throw a number line on the floor? And I said, yep, put a ruler on the floor. She called me a week later. She said, you know what happens when I put a big ruler on the floor in my classroom? I said, what happened? She said, the kids started to jump. Then they compared their jumps. Then they were doing all these things like dying down to see how tall they were. And who was the tallest? They were using the number line. They were doing things that they didn't learn as well with the worksheets, but that became a way to make the math come alive. When we do these things, we really are giving a liberal arts education to our children. And it's the way in which we have to see the world to open it up to biology, to psychology, to anthropology, to sociology. All these things exist right in our backyard. Well, I love the idea of making math come alive. And this kind of um, uh, reminds me that, you know, you talking about this, the way of, of children learning and, and in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Um, is there a time where adults should get out of the way to direct instruction? Because it sounds <laughs> yes. like it sounds like, like you said, you put the ruler on the floor and the kids kind of just went at it. You know, what are your thoughts about about giving direction? Is that necessary all the time? Well, I have um, a different category of different categories of play. One is what I call free play. And yes, the adults ought to get out of the way because a lot of times what we do is we intrude in ways that ruin the child's imagination. Let me give you an example. A, a child is drawing something and you walk in and you're so excited and you say, oh my gosh, you're drawing a circus. And the kid looks at you because it's not meant to be a circus at all. It's meant to be a landscape design. And he's trying to invent a park within the landscape design. And now you came in and called it a circus. Well, what's the kid going to do? Stop drawing the landscape design and stop planning what should go into the playground. Got it? So we become helicopter parents and we take the imagination and joy away from the kids. There are other times when we've invented the term guided play. And in the guided play example, you become kind of a coach rather than a director. You sit back and let your kids explore that number line. But then, you know, you can look and say, wow, who jumped farther? Now notice that I really just asked an open question. The kids are still in charge. They have agency. And that's a really important part. But at the same time, by asking that one little question, you're turning it into a math game. Do you see what you've done? Guide at the side, and we call it guided play. And what you don't want to do is be direct instruction-y with your kids all the time. And gosh, we spend too much time in that mode. Now, I'm going to do a switch on you just to get to adults again. Don't you feel like we're always told what to do? And don't we need that recess so we regain our own agency and our own imagination? So that's why I believe in play. Well, honestly, as you were talking about that, I was just thinking, man, elementary Catherine could have used the little guy to play in math because today <laughs> she might be able to, I don't know, calculate <clears throat> things a little bit better. Um, and, and, and I love the transition because I also want to turn it back to kidulting a little bit. We know we've been talking about a lot of how children learn and how we bring it into adulthood. Can, and we mentioned the installation at the Stepping Stones Museum for Children in Norwalk earlier. Can you hmm. talk about how do families or parents um, or adults interact? with those installations because I think it's called the ultimate block party. <laughs> yes, it was. It was. We did a small ultimate block party. Oh, it was like a few years ago and I'm thrilled to hear that it's still still happening in, in Norwalk. So um, one of the things we do is we have kind of a three-part equation for everything that we invent as part of Playful Learning Landscapes. And then I promise I'll get to your question. We start with um, with the cultural values and beliefs. What are parents and communities bringing to the table? And what do they want to see? And then you add to that how children learn. 
And children don't learn when they're passive, when you're trying to just, you know, shove information into empty heads because they don't have empty heads. They learn when they're active, when they're engaged, when it's meaningful and when it's socially interactive and joyful. And then we add a third part of the equation is what we want kids to get out of it. Well, we want them to be good collaborators who can work in teams, communicators, to know their content, critical thinking, to be creative and to have the confidence to try. So that's what we built in the Norwalk um, Ultimate Block Party, as in all of our exhibits. And then we watch as it's an intergenerational games, because parents actually get off the chair. They don't become observers anymore, and they start to play with the children. We're noticing that for the first time, when we put these exhibits in, the cell phones go down. And when the cell phones are down, the parents are seeing what the kids are seeing, and they become the guides in play with their children. So it's really quite exciting to watch these interactions. We've seen it at bus stops. We've seen it on playgrounds. We've seen it in libraries. In each of these cases, we're bringing the parents into their, cha into their childhood mode, playing with their own children. And it's a wake up for all of us. So I've got a list of things I got to do ASAP is to put down my phone, cuddle my plushie, play with some puzzles and get there some chalk and draw on the yeah. wall. And you know what? Just fling all the rules out the window because it's Friday. Uh, <laughs> That's it. That's it. Go enjoy the weekend. Right? Exactly. Well, Dr. Yeah. Kathy Hirsch-Pasek is a professor of psychology at Temple University. Thank you so much for sharing your joy with us on the show today and tell us that it's okay to sleep with your stuffed teddy. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. Coming up next, one California based slime maker says playing with slime can help you heal the inner child for some. What's your favorite childhood toy that you've come back to recently? Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. What toys from your childhood have you recently revisited? Kathy Flaherty on Twitter listed Lego, coloring books, kids books, probably because I have several friends who write them, bobbleheads, beanie babies, and stuffed blueies. You can also join the conversation. Send us a picture on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Joining us now is Olivia, Olivia Soth, uh, co-owner of OG Slimes, located in California. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Catherine. It's my pleasure to be a part of the segment today. Well, I never thought I was going to be talking about slime, so I'm so excited to talk to you about what's the origin story of OG Slimes and when did you get involved? So OG Slimes began all the way back in 2016. The founder, Christine Lee, was binge scrolling through Instagram one night and an interesting video of slime caught her attention and she just found herself going down the slime rabbit hole. So she was thinking like, what is slime? How do you make slime? Where do you even buy good slime? And at the time, slime, the slime industry was extremely niche and there wasn't enough information on the internet. So she searched for ingredients to experiment with and made her own one of a kind slimes, which provided an outlet for stress. Um, she basically began to share her creations on Instagram, and the one slime that burst the scene was Butter OG. She realized that she created the first ever butter slime texture. Um, within a year, OG Slimes gained 1 million followers on Instagram, and soon after I became co-owner, and we've continued to share our creativity through slime and to grow the business even further. That's amazing. I mean, I can't imagine binge scrolling and discovering slime. You know, what is it about slime that attracted your involvement in the first place? Um, I think it's a great creative outlet and it provides some stress and anxiety relief. It also like provides a lot of joy and allows us to just have fun. Um, yeah. I think you just nailed on a lot of the common themes that we've been talking about throughout this conversation, which I know you've been listening as well, is is finding joy and releasing anxiety and because we're all so stressed out and all that. You know, what's your what's your response to the kidult craze? Are you excited that it's a thing? Are you part of it? You know, what are your thoughts about that? 
Yeah, I'm definitely excited. It's a thing. Um, it's really interesting to me because I haven't heard of the term before, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, like the idea of adulthood has changed so much in the past few years. And I feel like we're breaking out of societal expectations and restrictions on it and like what it means to be an adult. Um, I think that the pandemic gave everyone a chance to slow down and really connect to themselves and find what really brings them joy. Um, so I don't believe there's an age limit to curiosity, joy, and fun. And if there's a group of people who want to have more of that in their lives and they find it through toys or slime, that's great. I think we all tend to resonate with what you just said. And it makes me feel a little bit better that you've also never heard of kidults because I also haven't heard of it until we started brainstorming to do this show, which has been super fun. Um, are, are people surprised that most of your customers are you know, technically kidults? Yeah, people are definitely surprised. Um, but to be fair, when people think of slime, they think of like the traditional gooey slime that you can find on the shelves. And when people ask me what I do for work, it's easier to show them versus try to explain how we make a living off of slime. Because for this, like, it's our art. We go above and beyond to make it a joyful experience for everyone. And it's also a product that provides a multi-sensory experience through various textures, scents, colors, and themes. Um, it can even provide like therapeutic benefits for physical and mental health needs, like those struggling with motor skill control or stress and anxiety. Well, so our producer, Katie Pellico, has described how shocked she was by the depth of feeling ignited by playing with slime. It transports her right back to childhood. And you just mentioning that, you know, the texture and the beads and, and just the movement can help with so many things. Do you hear this often? Do you hear the nostalgia, the learning, the, the releasing of the stress? Like, what are you hearing from, from people who are buying the slime? Yeah, I hear about it a lot. I was really happy to hear that story, too. Um, I think it it's it makes me really happy when people feel like they're being transported back to their childhood because I think it's so important, like doing things that allow us to reconnect with our inner child and play again, because I feel like we can heal parts of ourselves that we didn't even realize we needed healing by doing this. Um, you know, we grow up, we rush to grow up, and when we grow with the world, we lose sight of the importance of joy and play. So. Being transported back to your childhood and enjoying it is like a dose of like self-love and self-care. And I'm glad that slime can do that. And when you came in, did you have any expectations that this was going to go where it continues to go is to resonate with so many people? And it sounds like from all ages, even though a lot of your customers are adults. No, I didn't have any expectations. I, I just was happy to be a part of it. And we... Like I said, we we find it as like a creative outlet, um, but we're really glad that it resonates with so many people. Well, and in speaking of creative outlet, I think a lot of your your slime is so creative with so many different kinds of themes and colors and and characters. Even what what do you guys think of when you're when you're working on these new ideas? Do you do you get ideas from specific areas, or do you brainstorm? You know, what's that process like? Yeah. So every week we drop about seven new slimes and we come up with all of these ideas a month in advance because it takes time to make the slime and for it to clear up. But we're inspired by many things from our childhood and personal interests now, like foods, drinks, TV shows, games. I mean, we even have like a slime based on sunblock. And that brings us back to our childhood, too, like that smell, like it just reminds you of summer, you know? Um, for example, Christine loves eggs and boba, and I love matcha, so we have a lot of slimes based on these. And we basically come together and think of themes, scents, textures, colors, sprinkles, clay pieces, the label design, and so much more. But it all has to connect to the theme and to the slime and to ourselves. Like, it has to feel right. Well, I was going to say the moment you mentioned sunscreen, I can smell the sunscreen. It just took me to the beach. So if you make that <laughs> slime, <laughs> I'm on that. Do you have a favorite slime that you've made or a couple of them? My favorite slime probably has to be one of the matcha ones because I really love matcha. Um, our OG butter is really nice because it's super velvety. Um, I mean, all I mean, all of them are like my favorite. I love all of them. There you go. Um, um, you know, Fortune magazine said you you sort of balance your slime side hustle while working in social media and marketing for another company. 
I mean, it's a surprise and not a surprise that this is a side hustle. You know, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's not exactly a side hustle. I think I, I do pretty well with balancing both. But um, I really like being able to be creative with slime and then also utilize my skills in social media and marketing. Um, and I get to do that with both companies, which I'm really grateful for. That's really amazing. And when you spoke with Fortune magazine, you also shared your experience about being under mes- uh, underestimated uh, for being a slime company. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Yeah. So Christine and I like have run into a lot of obstacles, like aside from a pandemic and recession, but it's mostly with people who undermine our abilities because we're young women. And I feel like when they speak to us, we don't really get the respect or acknowledgement that we deserve. Um, they don't take us seriously just because it's like slime and we're also young. So I just want to take a quick moment to share um, a comment from Lynn from Branford, who said, longtime friends get together for dinner and we play apples to apples and laugh like children. Uh, Kathy, I would love for you to respond to Lynn's um, experience with her friends and playing apples to apples. Brava, brava. Lynn, I'm so happy you are doing that. It's giving you a chance to get together with your friends, keep that community alive. Um, I think everyone should follow your lead. That sounds like an amazing advice. And also get some slime and get those movements going and, and all that jazz. I just want to take a moment to thank Kathy and to Olivia Soth, who's a co-owner of OG Slimes, located in California, for joining us on the show today and just sharing your joy with us. It has been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. My I'm- pleasure. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate both of your time. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>